Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. Um, just wanted to come to you with a video on liquids. You will remember that last week we learned about solids um, and you found that it was um, very heavily based on their intermolecular forces. And we talked about all the different types of solids we have and all the different types of intermolecular forces that affect those solids. So today um, I wanted to do something quick about liquids. And when I say liquids, I just mean um, things in the liquid state um, of matter, right? Like solid, liquid, gas, things in the liquid state. Now, sometimes those might be pure liquids. Sometimes they might be aqueous solutions. Um, or any type of solution that's a mixture of things. But um, when we talk about liquids here, we're just saying anything in the liquid phase, okay? Um, so one of the physical properties, now luckily with liquids, it is actually um, a little bit more straightforward than solids. There was like a lot of little details in solids here. But basically um, with liquids, what we need to know is that the properties of liquids are dependent on their intermolecular force. So what are properties of liquids that we normally talk about? Um, so surface tension is one of those properties. And you guys might um, be familiar with something like this, where you can like pile a bunch of um, drops of water on top of a penny. You might expect them to overflow on the penny, um, but most exper experiments like allow about 47 drops of water to fit on a penny before anything overflows. And that's due to the property of surface tension. Surface tension um, is this kind of film here that, that gets formed that holds the water in its drop-like um, formation. Now water we know has really high surface tension. Um, and that makes sense because water has very strong hydrogen bonds, right? Strong intermolecular forces, therefore high surface tension. And um, essentially what happens is this is due to an imbalance of the intermolecular forces um, because these outer water molecules um, are having like imbalanced intermolecular forces because the inner molecules are pulling them in here, like the inner water molecules are pulling them in there. So anyway, that's what surface tension is. Some substance that would be completely nonpolar and only have London dispersion forces wouldn't pile up so high on this penny um, because the surface tension would not be as strong. And so what we need to know is that the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the surface tension is. And that's really it for surface tension. Another property of liquids that we talk about is viscosity. Um, now, viscosity is the resistance of flow of a liquid, um, or the resistance of a liquid to flow, I should say. Um, and so it's really understand, uh, easy to understand viscosity if you think about some examples. Like water has a pretty low viscosity. If you pour out water from a glass, it flows pretty easily. On the other hand, something like honey or molasses, which is what I have a picture of right here, um, is very viscous, that has a high viscosity, it resists flowing. Um, and you can measure viscosity in two ways. One, you could measure something about like how much is flowing in a certain amount of time. Two, you can use something like a marble or a lead um, like sphere to um, like start it at the top of the liquid and measure how long it takes to settle down. The more viscous the fluid, the longer it takes, the less viscous the fluid, the quicker it moves. Um, so those are two ways we measure viscosity. And viscosity, um, again, is due to intermolecular forces. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the viscosity, but it is also related to molecular shape and flexibility. And so what I mean by that is like for one one thing that I was thinking about was like, well, wait, if I just said that um, water, which has hydrogen bonding, which is a strong intermolecular force, is not viscous. Why is that? Because I thought like the higher the intermolecular forces, the more viscous the substance. But it's because intermolecular forces isn't the only thing contributing to the viscosity. Um, water is actually a pretty small molecule. And so the molecules don't get entangled with each other very much. Whereas like a long chain molecule, for example, um, like sucrose, right, which would be in sweeter substances like honey and molasses, um, those long chain molecules, while they have a lot of London dispersion forces, um, first of all, they're long, so there are a lot of London dispersion forces. 
Second of all, they are um, long and so they can entangle with each other. And because they entangle with each other, they are going to um, end up being more viscous. So intermolecular forces contributes to the viscosity, but it's not the only thing that will um, dictate how viscous a solution is. Okay, sorry, I had to pause for a second. Um, one of my nieces needed help with her kindergarten homework. Um, but anyway, uh, we were talking about um, viscosity and how intermolecular forces is not the only thing that contributes. Other things contribute as well. Um, but it is one of the features, okay? And then the last feature that we need to talk about a liquid is capillary action. Now, maybe in biology, you guys have talked about this um, before, but before we talk about exactly what capillary action is, we need to understand two, um, two ideas. So we have two types of forces. When we talk about intermolecular forces, right, we could classify them as being cohesive forces, um, which means the forces are between the same molecules. So you can see this little cute picture right here um, that shows like two water molecules connecting to each other. That's cohesion. Two of the same molecules connecting to each other, we call that a cohesive force. An adhesive force is when um, a molecule connects to something else. And so in this um, case for capillary action, it connects to the surface of the capillary. Um, which is just a glass tube. So here you can see it's like the water connecting to, let's say this is a glass molecule. Um, and so we have cohesive forces and adhesive forces. Cohesive forces um, in the case of water is the water sticking to itself. Adhesive forces is um, water sticking to the glass tube. Okay, so capillary action is literally this phenomenon that when you put a thin glass tube in a liquid, the liquid rises up the glass tube. Okay, um, that is what capillary action is. Um, things that are said to have a lot of capillary action, the liquid rises up really high in the tube, and things that have less capillary action, the liquid rises only a little bit in the tube. Um, so if the cohesive forces, which are the forces of um, the liquid sticking to itself, are less than the adhesive forces, the forces of the liquid sticking to the glass, then we will have a lot of capillary action. If the cohesive forces are greater than the adhesive forces, then we're gonna have less capillary action, which means the liquid will not rise up the tube as much. So let's look at this example here. We have water and we have mercury. Both are in the liquid phase, and so both will display some capillary action. Now, if we look at these two photos, um, we'll see two things. Number one, we can see that mercury has less capillary action than water because mercury rose less in the glass tube. Okay, I'm not sure that these pictures are drawn to scale. I think that mercury um, would actually be a little bit lower than the water, but regardless, it's just less, right? Um, and then the other thing is, you look at the shape of the meniscus here. Notice that water and most polar substances have a concave meniscus. Mercury is unique in that it has a convex um, meniscus, which is really interesting. For measurement sake, by the way, we still measure at the meniscus. So a mercury measurement would still be taken right here, while a water measurement would be taken right here. So we still use the meniscus to um, make a accurate measurement. Um, okay, but why would this be the case? Why would mercury um, have uh, stronger intermolecular forces, right? Because if, if it is less, um, if it has less capillary action, it means those cohesive forces, mercury to mercury, are really strong. Well, of course, mercury is a metallic substance. So mercury is going to display metallic bonding um, as its intermolecular force. And we know that metallic bonding is going to be super strong. So those cohesive forces of um, mercury to mercury are going to be super strong. And they're going to be stronger than a mercury molecule to the non-metallic glass. 
So that would be the adhesive force. And so since the cohesive force is greater, then we see that it has less capillary action. On the flip side, water, interestingly, has strong cohesive forces because it's got that hydrogen bonding water to water. Um, but it also is able to hydrogen bond to the oxygen in the glass because it's like silicon and oxygen to make the glass. And so it actually has really strong adhesive forces as well. And it turns out that that connection of water to the glass is quite strong. And that's why we observe capillary action um, in water. And so again, capillary action is something that is um, related to intermolecular forces, particularly those cohesive forces. Um, one thing that's interesting about capillary action is that is how um, water moves up a stem in a plant or a root in a tree and stuff like that. My biologist will know more a little bit about that, but um, often plants have small tubes that they call capillaries, and then the same exact thing happens. The other piece with capillary action is something as, as small as like dipping the end of a paper towel into water and then watching that water creep up the paper towel. That is due to capillary action as well. Um, just in a little bit of a different way. So there the water is connecting to the fibers of the, of the paper towel. Um, oh, the other piece is that capillary action is actually the basis of like dry fit clothing. So um, this idea of the uh, fibers of the shirt or whatever that you're wearing that's dry fit, um, they've actually used capillary action as a basis of that. Like how can they get the liquid to be drawn in to the fabric instead of like staying where it is. So they want to have the adhesive force of the sweat to the fiber of the clothing be stronger than the cohesive force of the sweat to itself. Um, and so I thought that was pretty interesting too. Oh, I forgot to mention, of course, the strong intermolecular forces of mercury. Um, is why mercury has that concave, excuse me, convex um, meniscus, which is pretty cool. Okay, awesome. So um, the last piece that we need to talk about liquids, um, those were the three properties we needed to talk about. The last piece is chromatography. Um, so chromatography is a separation technique that we use for things in the liquid phase, so mostly for solutions because they're mixtures and we want to separate things out. And chromatography is really based on intermolecular forces. So maybe we need to just do a quick um, refresher on some separation techniques and actually we'll delve into chromatography tomorrow. But um, we want to do some quick review of separation techniques. Remember, separation techniques um, are lab techniques we use to separate components of a mixture. And we have a variety of separation techniques. One separation technique, for example, is filtration, okay? And that's a separation technique that's based on size. And so you guys can imagine something like a mixture of salt, uh, excuse me, sand and water. Um, the sand would be a solid in the water, and so we could use a funnel and filter paper, and we could get the sand to collect up here and the water to drip out here. Um, and that would be one way we could separate the mixture of sand and water, right? Um, so we can use filtration when we have molecules of a different size um, that you know are going to separate in phases like that, particularly when we have solids and aqueous things together. We can get the aqueous to fall out as the filtrate and the solid to stay up with the filter paper. Okay, so that's one separation technique. Okay, um, one piece that's like just important about lab technique is once you get a solid on filter paper, you would normally need to place that filter paper in an oven to dry to ensure that all of the water or whatever um, aqueous thing that was on there, liquid or aqueous thing that was on the solid um, evaporated away. You would want to evaporate the rest of that by drying it. Okay, a second um, separation technique would be exactly what I talked about, evaporation. Okay, and that's what we would do when we put it in an oven. Um, and that would be something like here we have salt water. If we heat it, we can evaporate away this, the water and just be um, left with the salt. And you could do that with a Bunsen burner or in a drying oven. The thing with evaporation as a separation technique is that um, you don't actually collect whatever gets evaporated off. So depending on the purpose of your lab, maybe that's okay. But in other situations, you might need to collect that filtrate 
And so you would want to not use evaporation um, because you wouldn't want to lose the evaporated substance. Um, but evaporation is really based on boiling point, right? And we know that boiling point is, is based on intermolecular forces. Um, so obviously this ionic solid has stronger intermolecular forces than this covalent liquid. And so the liquid will evaporate out first. Okay, now um, I mentioned what happens if we want to collect what we would evaporate off. Well, that's when we would use distillation, right? And distillation is a lab technique also that says distillation um, based on boiling point. And it's just like evaporation, except it has this distillation tube to collect what um, boils off first. So this would be something where you have a mixture, let's say, of water and alcohol, two substances that are both in the liquid phase mixed together, um, so we can't use filtration because everything would just drip through. If we use evaporation, we'll lose one of the substances. So we'll use distillation where we heat a liquid down here. Um, the portion of the liquid that has a lower boiling point will boil, come here, go into this tube, and this is cold water running through the tube. So as it goes through the tube, it cools down and condenses and then drips into here. And so as long as the two or three or how many of our components of your original mixture of your original solution have different boiling points, you can um, separate those components out. So let's say this had three components. I would um, boil off the first component, have it drip into this right here, and then I would change out this flask, boil off the second component, have it drip in, and so forth. So that's distillation, which is uh, our third separation technique. Another separation technique that we have is um, using a centrifuge. They say centrifugation, which I find always funny. Um, but that's, we actually don't have one of those in our classroom, but it's just this idea that if you have a solution that maybe has some solid particles in it, um, like you've created, for example, a precipitate reaction, and the precipitate is well mixed in the liquid right now, um, or the yeah the liquid component, then what you would do is you would put it in a centrifuge, which is a machine that spins it really, really fast and causes the solid to settle down here. And so that's centrifugation. Um, I don't think it's super common for them to ask us about that, but I did see it in the curriculum, so I just wanted to mention it too. I thought this was pretty interesting right here. Um, a, a more advanced way you could use a centrifuge would be to create layers in your um, centrifuge tube. Um, and here they've used different percents of um, sugar solutions. And then they layer a um, the like mixture on top here. And then when they spin it, they can actually separate out even more. You can see like you get the large molecules. This was for a DNA separation, the medium molecules and the small molecules. Um, I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of our course, but I just thought it was really interesting. Um, so you would use a centrifuge when um, actively shaking something would help something fall or settle to the bottom. Particularly, this is useful in um, precipitate reactions for us. Uh, from a biochemist standpoint, they um, centrifuge blood very often. I think like platelets and blood cells will um, make different layers. And so I know um, in the medical field, they do often centrifuge um, blood for a variety of things. Um, so that's kind of cool. All right, um, and then lastly, this is the one we wanted to get to, and like I said, we'll do more detail tomorrow. We need to talk about chromatography. So chromatography is a separation technique that we use for things in the liquid phase. So it's when you have miscible solutions, so things um, like liquid, things in the liquid phase that have mixed together well, that's what miscible means. Um, and we need to separate them out. Perhaps they don't have different boiling points, so distillation might not be appropriate. Um, and so we would use chromatography. Chromatography separates things based on the intermolecular forces present. And that's why we're talking about it now. Um, and there are three main, well, there are a few different types of chromatography. Um, paper chromatography is one of them. It looks a lot like this picture right here, um, where this is a piece of paper, and maybe this is water down here, and then we see things move as the water moves 
by capillary action. The second version, I don't actually have a picture of paper chromatography because the picture is almost the same as thin layer chromatography. The only difference between thin layer chromatography and paper chromatography is in thin layer chromatography, this is normally some kind of glass plate with the silica gel on it. Um, so the difference is that the solid phase in the paper chromatography is actually those paper fibers and the solid phase in thin layer chromatography is a silica gel that is created. Um, sometimes we buy chromatography paper and I believe, I'm gonna look into that for tomorrow, but I believe chromatography paper just has the silica already coated on there for us. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Then we have column chromatography, um, which is where you use a column that has some most likely non-polar substance packed in here and then you load a sample and run it through and it'll separate out into these bands um, based on the intermolecular forces present. So we will do a deeper dive into chromatography, but I just wanted to give us like this quick review of separation techniques um, so that we are ready to look at chromatography a little bit more seriously tomorrow. We're gonna stop there. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon, bye.